ready when you are. All right. Um, I grew up in a really tiny town in White Salmon, Washington. Um, it's got a population of probably like 1,200 people if it hasn't gone up since I left. Um, I was raised by a single mom and have two older brothers. And um, once I was about 20 years old, I started thinking about joining the military. Um, I left for Fort Sill in 2013 and did my basic training there, and it was awesome. I loved every part of it. And then uh, AIT, I trained to be an intel analyst, and then I spent eight years doing that in Colorado. And um, once I got out, then I went to Hawaii to spend some time with my dad. Um, he's getting hospice care, and my brother's also over there and his new baby. Um, so that's kind of an overview, but um, to fill some gaps, uh, our mom was a very sick individual, uh, very um, combative, really aggressive, a lot of anger problems. Uh, and then in her 40s, she was diagnosed with um, like dementia, early dementia. And so that made more sense. But um, basically, my childhood was like drastically different than my brothers. Uh, they're five and six years older than me. All three of us have different dads. And my oldest brother and I, um, we had no relationship with our biological fathers. Uh, I was about nine years old when I decided to try to find mine in a phone book and call him up. And I was able to get a hold of him. And um, throughout my childhood, because of what my mom had put us through, I had this fantasy that my biological father would find out that I existed when I was nine and then maybe come and rescue me from that. Um, and then I met him, and he was a total asshole. Uh, he made me feel really stupid. Um, he was like commenting on my eye color and I'm like nine, so I don't know anything about anything. And he said that um, my eyes were hazel. And I said, uh, I think they're like kind of a greenish color. And he was like, yeah, that's like hazel. And that's all that sticks out from my relationship or interaction with him. Um, and the reason why I was so fixated on finding him and being rescued by him is because uh, being that I was much younger than my brothers and um, my mom herself had grown up in like foster care because her mom had her when she was 15. And then uh, she was raised by her grandma for a little bit and then her grandma passed away when my mom was 16 and then she decided to run away. And then she ended up in juvie for that. And then eventually she found a good foster mom who ended up being like a grandma to me and my brothers and being really good to us. We went to Christmas at her house every year um, and got the full like grandma experience. She's a great cook and like so loving, um, super Christian. So that kind of changed like my perception of different things growing up. Um, but to get a little bit deeper into some of my mom's issues with me, uh, I feel as though even though I'll never know because she didn't talk to me about it. Um, I feel like something pretty terrible must have been happening to her when she was a kid and going through foster care maybe or in juvie or out on the streets. And it seems like it took such a toll that instead of her viewing me as like her daughter and her child, it seems like she saw me as like a reflection of herself and just kind of like poured all that shame and hatred into me. Um, and that looked a lot like deliberately leaving me with people who were gonna do bad things to me. Um, some of like the earliest memories that I have are, sorry. It's okay, take your time. Do you look like your mom? No, not at all. Mm. I'm glad, <laughs> but uh, um, some of my earliest memories of some of the things that happened to me with a lot of people throughout my childhood 
was um, like smells and feelings and sights of like blood, like not full memories, right? But there'll be like little things that trigger like a little bit of a, like a shred of a memory. But um, as I got older, it became a lot more clear to me, like what I was gonna be expected to do with these people. And as I became more aware of it, I would push back because there's certain people, um, certain like, uh, I don't know how to describe them, like pedophiles um, that are good at making it seem like a treat. They're good at like giving money or candy or food or clothes or toys and like making you excited to be there and then shifting it. And then some people are just like, like awful right off the get go. Um, and it led to a lot of confusion of like, why am I being left here? Like, because my understanding is like they're babysitters or they're friends of mom or like there's, she trusts me with these people. And uh, <clears throat> sorry, let me just collect my thoughts. So as I got older and more aware and more experienced with certain people, because I'd see the same people again and again. And um, as I got older, that was an indicator to me that she was like, this was a choice that she was making to take me to these people. Um, so as that realization started to set in as I got older, and this is before I met my dad. So between like birth and nine, um, I would push back a little bit more. I'd threaten to run away, say, I don't want to go. I don't want to like, don't leave me here. I don't want to stay here. And each time that would happen, I'd be stuck in my room and she'd like literally nail the windows shut and then lock my door and, uh, and leave me like for a long time. Like not long in like the grand scope of things, but like, a day or two as a kid just being locked in a box, like no bathroom or anything like that. That, uh, it really, uh, changed, I think, what I could have been growing up. And, um, so yeah, that really fed into this desire for somebody to come and scoop me up and take me away from it. That being said though, as clear as I made it that I hated certain things, certain ones weren't that bad, right? So that's where it kind of goes from like, um, like I don't want to do this into shame because it started to feel like with certain people, it wasn't being done to me. It was something I was doing. And I was so afraid that people were gonna find out. And uh, I didn't, it's like so hard to explain like a child's uh, like mindset about things like this. Because as a kid, like, I wasn't thinking like, oh, people are gonna call me like a slut and think I'm promiscuous. As a child, I'm thinking, I don't know what this is, but it feels gross, it feels wrong. I know at least my friends like don't wanna be naked around other people. And so like, given that comparison, um, it just felt like I was like really fucking up and being gross and it was my choice and uh, that like over time, once these things stopped, uh, that just kind of became like my understanding of how to interact with men. Um, so around the age of 14, uh, it was beginning to taper off and I got my first period that year and my mom, I actually um, purchased like cemetery plots at Lyle Cemetery. It's like 20 minutes away from my hometown. And she like walked me up into the cemetery and showed me my plot and said like, this is where you're gonna be because you're done, I'm done. Like she was, I think she was trying to get across that like my, 
my purpose, my what I was meant to do for her. I didn't have that job anymore because I'm not like right for it anymore. You're too, I felt you're too old. I feel, exactly. I felt like I was being like like f fired, like terminated, basically. This is rural Washington. Yeah, very rural, rural, and that uh, that really feeds into it too because in a town that small. Everyone knows everyone. Perception is reality. And my mom was perceived as this like beacon in the community. Um, she had a daycare when I was a kid. And then around the time that I went to middle school, she finished up her master's degree in like sociology or something. And she got a job with the Head Start in town, the only Head Start in town as like the center coordinator. So kind of like a principal. And so like everyone in the community, especially in our church, just thought she was like the best thing ever. And I could never relate to that because she was like such a fucking monster at home. Like she was psychotic. Like Do you think up she in was, the, was doing this for money? I don't know what it was for because we really struggled with money. Like I know I talk about her having a master's degree, but like the way I describe my home growing up is it's literally a single wide trailer. They took half of the trailer off and built onto it to turn it into a house. So like we had like this like shack of a house with a trailer hitch still attached. Did she have a drug problem? No, not that I know of. And then it was just last year in Hawaii with our dad who's getting hospice care because he's on like such heavy medications he had like he had substance abuse issues so now he's got cancer and they're trying to treat pain and he's got such a like high threshold for pain medications and things like that so in that delirium he's admitted a few things that i didn't know about my mom like that they dealt cocaine before the boys were born that would have been in like the early to mid 80s but after that my experience with her growing up was like very Christian, no drinking except maybe a glass of wine. Anytime I would cry as a kid, she thought I was on drugs. She'd accuse me of being on drugs if I was breaking down because she was being like crazy and throwing shit or slamming things and it was too much. As soon as I'd start to break down, she couldn't see it for like the reaction that it was, but she treated it more like it's just coming out of the blue and like, why are you, why are you acting so crazy? You must be on something. And like, again, I kind of like absorbed all of that. And uh, I got really heavy into drinking after I turned 14, but I never touched drugs because I was so afraid of any like weird behavior I had being tied to that. And uh, it helped me though, because when I did decide to enlist and go for like a TS clearance, my background check was pristine because I'd never been busted for anything or been on anything. I was giving them honest answers in the interrogation. But um, so between 14 and 16, um, she was done with me and made it very clear she wanted me out, but it's not the same as living in like a bigger city because you can't just like walk out on the street and find a stranger to crash with or whatever. Like I said, like everyone knew me, everyone knew my mom. So when I did get out of the house, I had to just like go back there. And um, so I started partying a lot when I was 14. That was like freshman year of high school. I got my first boyfriend um, and uh, between 14 and 15 with him especially, everything that had kind of like piled up when I was little started to like cause problems with that relationship because like teenagers are kind of thinking similarly like when they get into relationships, right? Start thinking about like sex and things like that, kissing everything. And it was like so weird for me because I had such an aversion to him kissing me. So we put that off for almost like the whole first year of our relationship. We didn't kiss. 
which I know seems ironic, but then he started to like want us to lose our virginities to each other and it like destroyed me because uh, I wasn't thinking about it that way. Like by that age, I'd come to terms with certain things. I'd heard enough about the things that people were doing to know like more about like what I'd been partaking in when I was a kid. And so for me, like he's thinking we're gonna lose our virginity to each other. And I'm thinking like, I lost it like when I was probably like four, like, and so, and it just, it made me fucking hate him so much. He was so nice to me. He was like the best high school boyfriend you could possibly have. Sorry, it's so weird because I don't know you, <laughs> but um, but um, he would like take me out on nice dates and buy me things, and uh, he got his like license and he wanted to drive me everywhere and he was like he was like obsessed with me. He was so good to me and I was so fucking nasty to him because I like couldn't really. I felt like I hated him so much and I couldn't make sense of it. But I just started acting on it, and uh, and at these like parties that I was going to when I was that age, um, I would just like get wrecked, and then just like act like a slut. Like as soon as I was drunk, I wanted to take my clothes off, and I wanted people touching me and talking to me and taking me places. Like I wanted it. I felt like that was like what I was supposed to do. And, um, and like, obviously he couldn't take that. Like he wanted to stay together too. And he wanted to stay friends and everything. And then I'd like give him a hug and it's trying to turn into more. And I like couldn't handle that. And uh, eventually we fully broke it off. This is like before I even turned 16. And um, shortly thereafter, I had my 16th birthday drunk on like the floor of someone's trailer watching fireworks on TV. And um, it was about a week after that, I went to another party in town at this place called the Grange Hall. It's like a barn basically where people have like bigger parties in town. And so I went there to see um, like friends of a friend who were playing in a band there. And after they finished playing, I went outside to see like what's happening afterward. And there was one guy who's like, I think he was probably like 19 or 20 at the time. And I'd seen him at a few different parties. He and his girlfriend were like known to like kind of coordinate a lot of this stuff. So I went up to him. I was like, what's going on tonight? Where's the party? And he said, oh yeah, like we're gonna go with my friend Jeremy. We're gonna drive up to Trout Lake. There's gonna be a ton of people there. And so I got in the car with those two and his friend Jeremy and we went up to Trout Lake, which is an even smaller town that's like 20 minutes like up into the woods. They have one gas station and like a little like corner store. And we get to Jeremy's house and it's just this guy and his girlfriend and Jeremy. And Jeremy on the way up there was talking about like he just got divorced. So I'm thinking like he's like old as fuck. And so we get up there and we're like sitting around and kind of drinking. And I'm just thinking as time goes on, I'm like, when is everyone going to get here? Like, there's like nobody fucking here. This is lame. And so I told the guy, the one that I knew, I was like, I'm just really tired. I just want to sleep. And then maybe you can like drive me back down the hill in the morning. And that guy, Jeremy, was like, here, you can take my room. I'll sleep on the couch. And so I went and I passed out in his room. And then hours after that, I wake up to him like crawling into bed and reaching under my shirt. And like, I didn't, I just went with it, right? And, um, but it felt fucking like, it just felt so awful because I'd had a little break from that. And like every interaction I'd had after that was like fully like my pursuit and something that I thought like I was into. And that felt like what I was used to, which is like, I'm just here and like, you're gonna do what you need to do. And I need to just like, like wait until it's over and then we're good and it's fine. And so 
that happened, but at night, Corey and his girlfriend left and went back to their house, so they left me alone in this guy Jeremy's house, and he didn't take me home for, like, two days. And, like, it just kind of, like, at first I felt, like, really, like, disgusted and, like, shut down because it took me back to that, but shortly after that, I started looking around and I'm like, this is like somewhere that I can stay though and not go back to mom. And I fucking hated my mom at that point. And she hated me. She was like so volatile all the time. And like school was like a dumpster fire for me. Every year I'd like start strong and then I just quit turning in my work and sleeping in class and dressing like shit and acting out. And so by that time, I like given up on school. And so I was thinking like, I'm just gonna drop out and I'm just gonna stay here. And so I did that. And uh, after some time had gone by with this guy, Jeremy, my brothers caught on to what was happening because like I said, everyone knows everyone and people knew Jeremy and those same people knew my brothers and word got to my brothers that this like 30 year old man was like in a relationship with me and I, I had just turned 16. And my brothers at that point in my life, it was so weird because like it felt we never really like bonded that well because there's such a huge age gap and our experiences at home were so different. And as soon as they could move out, they did, which was when I was like 11 and 12. And um, so I wasn't like close with them in that way. But when they heard about this, they went and found Jeremy at work and they like cornered him and beat him up. And I guess like, well, I don't want to say something like incriminating, but they like really fucked him up. And then he stopped talking to me for a couple days. And I know this sounds weird, right? But like, I couldn't fucking handle it. I couldn't handle being like left by him. Like after I had like decided that that's where I wanted to be, um, I was just like so upset that I would have to like go back. And so I would not leave him alone. And basically we had this arrangement where like he would come into my hometown and then have me like hide in the back seat of his car so he could take me back to his house. And things went like that for a little bit. <clears throat> and then um, my mom was aware of the situation after that too and told me that I like could not come home after that. And uh, so I stayed with Jeremy. And then when I was 17, I got pregnant and um, at the time, I was trying so hard to act like him and like emulate that age and that like maturity level and like life experience and stuff. I was like, yeah, I'm ready to start a family. Like, this is what I want too. And so I got pregnant and then we got engaged and we had a son together and um, I really, really tried to like fit that, fit that mold and like be a good mom because like I knew that even at that age, like I really wanted to be the complete opposite of her. Like I've spent probably my whole adult life trying to identify an opposition with my mom. But um, I just like, I felt like I was fucking suffocating because like once I had our son, I looked at myself differently. I felt like, like more important because I'd made somebody, I was in charge of somebody like, and that made it like so much harder to be around Jeremy or like act like a partner to him because I didn't see it that way anymore. I felt like I was more like a possession to him or like someone just kind of coexisting with him. And because like the attraction was starting to wane, then he just wait until I fell asleep and do it then. And so like, I just, after I think maybe like a year of that, I couldn't do that anymore. I got a job at Big Five Sporting Goods and I started to think like, I can find a way out of this. I can like work really hard and get my own money and get out of this. 
And it was actually while I was at Big Five, I met my recruiter's wife and was training her there. And she started to tell me about like the military and what it could do for my life, like school being paid for and medical benefits and maybe even a signing bonus, depending on what kind of job you get. And if you get the Intel analyst job, you'll have a clearance to fall back on. And this is like embarrassing to admit now with um, kind of like the culture of everything, but I really wanted to be a cop when I was that age. And so I'd gone on a few ride-alongs and tried to get an idea of like what I would need to have to go and apply for a job like that. And a lot of them had military experience, but specifically they said, don't be an MP, be an Intel analyst because so many people fall off this job after like a year and you'll want like a clearance to fall back on to get your foot in the door for like high paying entry level jobs. So that's uh, when I started to kind of like think about starting over and like making something out of my life and getting away from my hometown and getting away from Jeremy. But unfortunately what ended up happening is as I was approaching my ship date for basic training, he like preemptively filed for divorce and I was like, not to make excuses, but I was a dumbass kid and I asked somebody else to read the court paperwork for me and be like, what am I about to sign? Can you explain to me like what this says? What is this? And they said like, oh, it's like nothing is going to change. Everything's going to stay the same. It's there's no changes. You're just going to be divorced. And I was like, fuck, yeah, that's exactly what I want. And it turns out that I was like agreeing to not have custody of our child anymore and also agreeing that I owed him back child support for months and I signed it, <laughs> like happily, willingly signed that. And uh, right before I shipped out, it's finalized. I get my paperwork. I give it to my recruiter so that he can start figuring out like, how many dependents do I have? What kind of pay am I gonna get while I'm at basic training? And I'm thinking like, hell yeah, like I'm gonna get BAH because I have my son as a dependent. I'm gonna put a bunch of money away. I'm gonna come out with a fat savings account for us and we can start fresh. Instead, I showed up to basic training owing back child support and then something that a lot of people don't realize is it takes a minute for your pay to catch up in basic training. And so I'd only earned like one month worth of pay before it was Christmas block leave. And our drill sergeants had told us like, um, you can stay here for Christmas block leave and just clean and get smoked the whole time, like have to do like push-ups basically, or you can buy yourself a ticket and fly back home and go have Christmas. And like, who's that lucky? Who gets to do that in the midst of basic training? And so I was thinking like, I don't have shit for money right now, but like I'm gonna use this paycheck to fly back home and like see our son and spend time with my brother. And, uh, and I had a car leased at the time and I've like never told anybody this cause I'm like embarrassed about it. But basically I didn't have money to make that payment. I skipped the car payment and bought a plane ticket instead so I could go back home. So what ended up happening is my car was taken away, right? Um, and then with the back child support, like my credit was destroyed. And so I graduated AIT and luckily a lot of people got like interim clearances in AIT because their investigations were still going. But like my clearance came through lickety split because there was nothing to it. And so instead of having an interim clearance, I had a full on like TS clearance when I graduated which was a blessing because my credit got ruined at the same time. And that's a huge part of maintaining your clearance is having like good finances, good credit, so that people can't use like your financial instability as leverage over you. I think that's basically what they're worried about. Um, and so once I had my job, I was just like riddled with anxiety that I was gonna lose it at any time because you lose your clearance over shit like this all the time. I had to take people to go and like get flagged for having fucked up finances. So I had that hanging over my head and then the custody, of course. And in the midst of that, as sloppy and stressful as everything was, while I was at AIT, I met my second husband and he was my age, like a couple years older than me, like 
the most like physically fit, like normal looking guy probably in our class. And so when he started giving me attention at AIT, I was thinking like, one, I didn't think I had it like this. And two, like, this will really be my new life. Like I'll have a spouse that's my age that I'm really happy with and really attracted to. And then like we can be together and that can make it even easier for me to get my son back. But um, once I graduated and moved to Colorado with my second husband, he was fucking crazy too, which it took me a long time to realize that you kind of repeat those patterns throughout your life until you deal with it. Um, again, just really volatile, serious anger issues, and then like a ton of cheating throughout, like right off the bat. And uh, when I had to go back home after AIT to get my things and move down to Colorado, and in that time, I met up with my like childhood best friend and uh, I told her a little bit about like what had already happened and she was like, you need to get this annulled. Like, this is not a good guy. This is fucked up. Like, you need to get out of this and then just like come back home. And I was like, that's not an option anymore. Like, I have to go to Colorado. I have to be married. I'm not gonna leave this person. This is my chance. Like, no matter how like fucked up and crazy he's acting, I really wanted my life to look better and like different and have a chance to turn this around. I still felt like I could undo the damage that had been done, but it just got like too much to handle. Like we're calling the cops on each other. Like he would break shit and hurt me and I would call the cops and then he'd go and call the cops to make it look like he hadn't done anything. And it was such a mess there too um, that like, just a couple years after that, I flew back home for a little bit and stayed with Gaby again. And um, in that time though, <laughs> I went back home and I was like starting from scratch or trying to. And uh, I, I got like all of my military shit moved up to Washington. I got like everything done that I needed to have done. And then I even started working like side jobs and stuff. And then I was borrowing this couple from church's car until I could buy my own. And over time though, I'm like so shitty about communication or I was that I was like blowing Gaby off and not talking to her when I was having worse days. And then Ryan was reaching out, my husband, and I wanted to like, I really wanted to make that work. I wanted to go back to that. And I had hope that maybe like, if he got like anger management or something, like he said he did, maybe it would be like totally different if I just gave it another shot. And like, as I'm blowing Gaby off, she's being hurt by that because she worked so hard to get me set up there and take care of me and give me a soft place to land. And then I just wasn't even talking to her. Um, and so she got pissed and she texted me while I was at work one day and she was like, um, these people, my, my friends from church, they want their car back. If you don't give it back today, they're gonna report it stolen. And, um, and I no longer had a place to stay because I was also like rooming with another couple from church who had like a renovated garage or whatever. So in one day, in one fell swoop, no car, no place to stay, and like Ryan in my ear. So for me, it was like such a clear choice. I, was, I have to just go back there, at least there. I have my own apartment with my husband. We have a car, I have a life there. I'm like somebody there. I'm not just this like free floating thing back home, surrounded by all my peers who are like flourishing in their lives right now. And that was like the added thing. I know that seems petty, but it like, it just felt awful to work that hard to change things and then be surrounded by all these people that didn't have to work that hard and their lives are taking off and yours is tanking. And uh, so I made the choice to return to Colorado. And it was about a year after I came back to Colorado that uh, Ryan and I had our son together. Um, and I have him, he's the light of my life. I felt a lot more ready for him and able to take on mothering. Um, 
In the midst of all this instability, though, I really came to terms with the fact that, like, if I were to re-enter my first son's life, that would be such a detriment to him because as gross as Jeremy had to be to be a 30-year-old man pursuing a 16-year-old child, he had, like, remarried already and to somebody his age, and our son was, like, settled into life with them and calling that lady mom at that point. And I started to feel like, I wasn't ready for that. I don't know that I could ever like move far enough away from my experience with his dad to not have that affect how I treated him or raised him. I knew how my mom treated me based on things that she'd experienced or things that I'd feel like she probably experienced. And I made the decision over time that I'm not gonna pursue that. I'm hoping that he'll do what I did when I was a kid and he'll wonder about me and want to be rescued and maybe like find me and reach out to me because he still lives so close to my brother who still lives there. And that like, I, I feel like it would just be so easy for him to find me if he wanted to. I feel like I want to leave it his choice to like try to search for me rather than like try to like infiltrate his life in that way because there's just so much that would come along with that, so much explanation. Like, you know, as he gets older, I'm sure he can factor in the age difference and understand what that means. But at the age that he is now, which um, he's like still a kid for sure, but uh, I think that it would just be like so damaging and so disorienting to a child at that age. Like he's gonna be coming up on like puberty soon and things like that. And I feel like that would just decimate a kid at that age to like have their, their absentee mom like re-enter the picture and explain why they left in the first place and have to grapple with the idea that like their dad played into that somehow, the person who is raising them. So, my choice now is to leave it and uh, raise my other son. And um, uh, <clears throat> while I was in the military, um, it got like trickier and trickier to balance things out with my second son's dad, my second husband. And um, eventually, I mean, I would have to, so we're dual military or we were. He had the same job as me, obviously. We went to AIT together. and uh, But he worked at Division, so he was like a desk jockey. And then I worked in 1st Brigade, so I was actually doing like field training pretty often um, because we're supposed to be like the first to deploy if something happens. So I was in the field constantly. And uh, in that time, he was very clearly like not honoring our relationship and it just making it like obvious to me. Um, and a big part of that that like really uh, wasn't something that I was like willing to deal with anymore is the thought that like our kid was in the house when he was like having different people around. And uh, so our son wasn't even a year old when we divorced or we split up and then we filed for divorce, but that court case got dropped so many times because I wasn't around to even go to the first hearing, the initial status conference. Um, and a couple years after we divorced is when I shipped to Afghanistan for my first and only deployment. Um, and I was very excited about that. I didn't want to leave our son, but I was so excited for the chance to have that experience because it's like kind of a rarity these days for like regular military people to deploy. Like SF is a totally different ball game, but like just regular like combat support MOSs that you don't really expect to like get to deploy unless you're staying in for like 20 years. And so the fact that I had that opportunity was so exciting to me. And again, thinking about all the money I'd saved, not paying rent, not paying a car payment and just stacking like combat pay on top of that. And it was also really nice and really fulfilling for me because I trained so hard on that job. And then I finally actually got to use those 
skills and like real life scenarios. So again, I felt like very purposeful, very important and like motivated about my future. But um, about halfway through, uh, I was working in co-ops, so that's current operations, OSINT, op open source intelligence analysis, um, ISR, so uh, that's intel surveillance and reconnaissance. Uh, basically, you tell like the drones where to go and what to look for, and they give you like counts of like personnel at different compounds and things like that, so we can decide if we're gonna send anything that way, right? Um, so in the mix of all that, right as fighting season was ramping up in the summertime, we heard over like the speakers on the FOB, um, like the base, uh, that somebody was shooting at the base. And so everyone's freaking out and thinking it's like very, very serious, right? Because we get reporting all the time that I'm looking at myself saying like, these are people that we're targeting, this is the place that we're targeting and the time and everything. So I'm looking at reports that back this up as a possibility. And uh, once I heard that over the speaker and everyone's talking about it in the JOC, so the Joint Operations Center, um, it was my job to kind of brief everyone on what was happening and then help make a decision about what QRF was going to do about it. Now, um, I had like two sets of orders for this deployment and one was from NATO and that was advise and assist. So what people imagine we were doing in Afghanistan, like training their own military and police. And then I had a second set of orders from 4ID, which basically said that it was going to possibly be more of an offensive mission with some like support for like parliament elections. But um, basically uh, when this person was shooting at the base, we called in the Afghan police to deal with it first, but they didn't want to approach the person. This person standing in like really tall grass right outside the FOB near like the vehicle entry point, I think. And um, it was hard to make out like what they looked like or what their age might be or anything like that. But the Afghan police wouldn't even approach this person. They're standing like a field away and won't come any closer. And this person's just like unloading rounds at the FOB with a pistol, granted. But um, he ducked down into the grass when he noticed the Afghan police were in the area. And when he came back up, we had such like, uh, blurry footage from the drones, basically, that when he stood back up, everyone around me was so convinced he had a beard, right? That's what we look for, too, to determine, is this someone who's like a like military-aged male, right? And so I was like, I'm thinking like, yes, let's like put this to a stop, let's end this, like QRF is on the way, they'll deal with it, do what you need to do. And um, so they arrived right on the other side of the fence and they got their 50 cal ready. We waited and then they shot the guy down and it was like completely excessive, right? It's a 50 cal for like a human being that's not that far away. I don't know if you've ever seen a 50 cal firing, but it's like insane. And um, and then after that all happened and the guy was clearly like dead in the field, um, I, I had to like keep eyes on this person, right? So I'm like watching the footage of this person like convulsing on the ground. Eventually they stop and he was left there for like the whole day. And as time is going by and we're using like different tools to get footage of this, we looked at the PTIDS footage and it turned out that this was like a little boy who had ducked into the grass when he saw the police coming and he tried to kill himself. He shot himself like in the mouth, but it didn't kill him. So when he stood back up, he was very disoriented and had blood like running down his cheek and chin and neck. And it looked like a beard with like really poor footage. But once we looked at the PTIDS footage, which is what I use to get clearer images to build a storyboard, which is basically like images from start to end and explanations, analysis, and any reporting that might go along with it. And like I said, like I even, I had reporting talking about Haqqani Network patrolling that specific village that was in that area. And 
And I had to explain that um, once, once we did find out that it was a child, once some people had come to like gather the body later in the day, um, then I had to explain that Haqqani Network's been going to these villages. It's a normal thing for them to like give weapons to kids and send them outside of the fob because it will set off this type of chain of events. And it's easy to like build propaganda off of that and say like, hey, look, they're just like killing the kids in the village for no good reason. Like, don't trust them, don't talk to them because that's what we count on, right? We count on people all around the FOB in these villages to give us like reporting about threats and things coming down the line, right? So that's like a great way to get people to not wanna talk to you if they think you're a monster that just kills kids for no reason. And so it worked out exactly the way that I think that they wanted it to. Um, but once that happened and I had to like watch that whole thing play out, realize that it was a kid and then use images of this dead kid just laying out and stiffening in the sun while nobody's coming to collect his body. And that's, uh, that's like, that's the hardest part for me is that like nobody was coming to collect him up. And, um, uh, I don't like it felt different if it had been a man I was like fuck it like he's doing some bad shit like whatever he can lay out there and then I found out that he was like 12 years old and I was like where are his parents why didn't they come and get him he's like turning yellow and fucking like when they they put him in the back of a truck to take him away and they just like picked him up and like tossed him down in the back of the truck and drove off and I could just see his like stiff body like rattling in the back of the truck and I couldn't fucking believe it because I was like, it just like, like that's a kid. Like, and I think that I had spent enough time in a different kind of life and far away from my mom and not talking to her to be so far away from my experience of like feeling, and I know there's no comparison, right? But I felt like so far away from being a kid that wasn't like cared about. I felt like that could have happened to me when I was a kid and nobody would have really noticed. That's how I felt when I was a child. And that got kind of reactivated when I watched this um, happen with this kid in Afghanistan. And so that being said, when I came back home from that, I felt so differently and uh, so like careless. Like I felt like very indifferent, like I didn't give a shit about my job anymore and I didn't like the people I was around and I just didn't see the point of any of it. And you've like, you can't be that way and like do your job in the military, right? And, um, and then I started having like sleep issues and panic attacks and like <sighs> anger issues. And uh, finally I took myself to behavioral health and I found a psychiatrist there and just started telling him, like, I don't, I can't function. Like, I want to be dead so bad. I want to be gone so bad. Like, it's so uncomfortable to just exist because, you know, I worked so hard to get away from one thing. And then it's on to the next thing. I worked so hard to get away from that thing and fix it. And then it's on to the next thing. And then, I, and then I'm like back through the shit with my second husband and I've got to work hard and get through that shit. And then deployment, again, it felt like a huge opportunity and something that was really going to like 180 things for me. But um, it just seemed to dig me deeper and deeper and keep pushing me back. So, um, so I started talking to the psychiatrist and uh, he explained to me, he's like, you, we can manage this. We can get you on medications. You can do this or you can be medically discharged because you have PTSD. They will discharge you for that. And so I just took him up on that. And uh, I was like, let me let me get the fuck out of here because I can't do this anymore. As badly as I wanted this, as badly as I wanted to like complete a career and like do good and be worth something and make all this money. Um, I just like, I couldn't fucking do it and I didn't care anymore. And uh, it started to become like really hard to like find a way to put anything into my son, right? Cause I was just like, you know, he's a child. I love him so much. I would never do anything bad to my son, right? But like, it was 
it, that, you know, mothering should come fairly naturally, right? And I felt like I had to like force myself to take care of him. And like that was making me hate myself even more because uh, I was like, this isn't coming naturally. And, and it's like so much work to just give him the bare minimum. And he deserves so much more than that. And uh, so once I got out, um, it was crazy. As I was getting out, COVID hit. And uh, it was actually, I was at a voluntary 30-day inpatient program called Strong Hope in Utah. It's an excellent program. Um, but while I was there and getting a lot of help from my problems and getting on antidepressants and everything, um, we started seeing like news on the TV in our little like clinic area talking about this new virus from, you know, and, uh, and everyone's freaking out and thinking like, what is this? Should we take it seriously? And lo and behold, I get back from this 30 day program and like all hell is breaking loose. There's like the quarantines and everything, like mass panic and like everyone misunderstanding what's going on and having no trust and businesses shutting down. And my plan had been like, okay, I, I'm going to tackle these like mental issues that I'm having right now. And then I'm going to go back to school. I'm going to finish school. There's still a chance, right? And uh, I get enrolled in school. And with COVID happening, all the classes changed to like an online format. And I was going to a community college at the time. And their online format was garbage. It was so fucking hard. And so I ended up just giving up on that and uh, just kind of like coasting along for a little bit until, um, until uh, <laughs> my second husband, he had been in Korea for like a little over a year and he was anticipating coming back to the States. He was supposed to finish out his contract there, get out of the military and come back to Colorado to help me co-parent so we could do 50-50. And he met a woman over there and they got serious very quickly. And he decided to move to California with her instead of coming back to Colorado. And when that happened, I was like, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing here. Like, I wanna go, I wanna go back to Washington or somewhere. And I knew that my oldest brother was on the big island in Hawaii. We spent some time there when I was little. And so I reached out to him and he had just had a baby. He was telling me that our dad was over there getting hospice care. And I decided that like, I just wanted to be close to like the little bit of family that I like felt good about and wanted to be close to. I wanted my son to like get that experience too because he'd never met any of my family. Um, and it was there that like, kind of uh, the type of person that I had tried so hard to be in my adult life, I stopped caring about it and I wanted to do something easy. And so with COVID, with you know everything else that's happening right now and OnlyFans being such a huge thing, I decided to get into that a little bit for easy money. Somehow I had like, I mean, not like a lot of people following me on social media and stuff, but enough that like immediately I was raking in like so much money doing that. And uh, I started to feel like, you know, I don't really give a shit like what this looks like to anybody anymore. I just want to like make my money and like, and just enjoy my life for once. I was in Hawaii and making easy money. I had like, I had to spend 10 minutes a day to make like 30 grand in a month, you know, like it was a no brainer for me for a long time. But um, I also like started to feel kind of burnt out on just doing the same shit all the time and having to talk to these people. Cause that's another part of that. You don't get to just like post pictures and videos. You need to like respond to people and send out more shit for them to pay for. And I just didn't want to keep talking to these people because they've got all these expectations. And uh, and I was just, I don't I don't care about those people, you know, like I was like, just look at me. That's it. And then give me your money. And that's all I want. Like, but um, one person that was uh, subscribed to my OnlyFans found after he found my OnlyFans, he found my Instagram 
And uh, he messaged me a few times saying like, I'm on the big island too. Can I like take you out to coffee? Can I take you to dinner or whatever? And I'm thinking like this, is another person that thinks I'm gonna be like a prostitute and they can meet up for a date and then like pay and have me for like the whole night or whatever. And I don't wanna deal with that shit. And so I put it off and put it off. And then eventually he like started saying some like genuinely nice things to me. Like, hey, like it seems like you're not having a very good day. Are you doing okay? Or like I'd post something about like how I was feeling or whatever. And he'd be like really nice and supportive about it. So eventually I was just like, yeah, like let's go get coffee at like my favorite place. And in my mind, I'm thinking like this guy's gonna be weird as hell but I'm gonna have my coffee and dip. But um, he ended up being great, and that's my boyfriend now. Um, and he's got like an awesome job in Virginia. And so my son and I, after a while, of course, um, but not long enough by most people's standards, uh, we ended up moving with him to Virginia. He had to leave and it was, um, kind of this decision of like, if he leaves and we stay, then that's it. And I felt like he was so different than like anything I'd experienced before. Um, even though it's like not the most kosher way to meet somebody, like it felt so like good. And so like, not necessarily safe, but very comfortable right away. And that was something that I like was not used to experiencing my life. like feeling genuine care and support and like consideration about things that were important to me. And like, he took a little bit of my background information and it seemed like he took it upon himself to kind of like help me figure myself out and get better. And, um, and so that's where we're at now. We're in Virginia and I'm like much happier, much more stable. Um, I'm sure I'm still gonna need years of therapy, like effective therapy to really work through this stuff. But I'm like feeling more optimistic about my future and more sure of it than I have in a very long time because finally I feel like all these things that I've really struggled with and been hurt by have like turned into tools for me and experience that I can look back on to like level myself out because when so many like intense things have happened, you start to feel like there's just, it's always gonna happen. You're always on like high alert for the next shit that's gonna fall apart as good as everything might look. And that's obviously taken a toll on us a few times, but another thing that stuck out to me is like, he's so like gentle about it and understanding about like why I'm acting the way I'm acting and he like, really wants to learn about like why certain things that would be so normal to other people like really affect me and send me spiraling and it's like it's so cool to have someone like passionate about learning about another person so um and like my son is doing amazing uh his dad's parents live like 20 minutes away from us so now he gets to see his like really wholesome put together grandparents all the time. It's obviously had like such a great influence on him. And um, it seems like things might really turn around for us now. And I feel like so driven now. Um, and I just feel like it's, I feel like it's important for like someone who's in the midst of a lot of shit that might be similar to what I've felt I feel like it's important for them to see that that's not the end state, that pit is not the end state and like healing is not linear and like character development is not linear. You can be like a great person for months and be a shit person the next second. And that also doesn't have to be the end state. So as like cheesy as it may seem, like I just, I feel like it's important for people to see that you can no matter what the circumstances are, of course, I don't know what everyone's been through, but like you can dig yourself out of it if you want it badly enough. If you want to be, you have to want to be a good person, not just like be successful and achieve what you want, but like I really want to be like a good person. And, and you know, as badly as you want it, sometimes you can be like really fucked up still. And so it's like, 
Um, yeah, I just, I feel like that's, that's pretty much it. <laughs> that's one hell of a story. <laughs> it was a lot. You've been through so much. It's nice to see you getting some good luck finally. Yeah. Yeah, I feel very, very lucky. And plus, um, my boyfriend's mom has like, she like has me call her Ummi. Uh, they're Pakistani. And so that means like mom. And so like she texts me all the time to see how I'm doing. And we have like dinners at her house. And like when when it was Eid, she like dressed me up and like it 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 feels wildly uncomfortable in the moment with things like that that are like so foreign. But um, after the fact, like it's pretty amazing to like have a chance at that. Um, and so, yeah, I'm like very fortunate and very thankful. I know not everyone is gonna like luck out the way that I have, but yeah, it's worked out for us for sure. That's great. All right, thank you so much, Victoria. Thank you. Thank you very much.